I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Hey guys, if you like what I'm doing, click the Amazon banner at the top of the homepage on FascinationStreetPod.com and do all of your shopping through Amazon. Once you click on it and it takes you to Amazon, you can bookmark it or add it to your favorites and you won't have to go to my site each time. It helps me keep the show going and again, thanks for listening. Welcome back Streetwalkers. This episode is with Raffaello De Grotola. Raffaello is an Italian actor, director, and filmmaker currently living in London who used to live in the United States and has been in such films as Ron Howard's Rush, Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan, and the new film currently in theaters, The Hustle. In this episode, we talk about how certain parts of life are different in America than they are across the world, and we talk about what got Raffaello into filmmaking. We talk about some of the films that he's done and some of the films that he has coming up. And of course, we talk about why some of these subjects that he tackles in these pieces are so important to him. So enjoy, folks. This is writer, director, actor, and filmmaker, Raffaello De Grotola. Welcome to Fascination Street, Raffaello De Grotolo. How are you doing today? I'm very good, thank you very much. I'm waking up in Italy. I must say that the Americans are always number one at pronunciation. I've spent my whole life in England, and uh, I don't think anyone's managed to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> the Americans, though, they get it, number one. I don't understand why the English can't do it. That's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> so... What are you doing in Italy right now? Uh, actually, we've got a family home here, which uh, my mum sort of pioneered over the years to move back to her home country. So now we sort of every now and again get on a flight and come over. I was actually playing a soccer tournament in the south last week, and so I got uh, a flight up on my own. So, yeah, I'm, I've been at the house for a few days on my own trying to find my feet again. You played in a tournament just for fun, or or are you also a professional soccer player? It, it, I'm not a professional, but I've played, you know, my whole life, and uh, it was a it was a writers' league in Europe. Uh, anyone who's had their work made into a film or published into a novel is invited if they've had some past in in football. So they've got some interesting players that come through. Um, so we played with against Germany. Italy and Sweden. So it was a four team tournament in the south near Matera, which was the city of culture in this year in Italy. Wow. So there's a whole soccer tournament just from writers who also play soccer? That's so cool. Yeah, it's really cool actually. It gets us around and about and they, they put us up in a hotel and feed us and we get to play in a stadium and the the standard's pretty good, so it was it was nice. That's awesome. Was there a big turnout, a big crowd? Yeah, the locals came into the stadium and they sort of filtered in and out throughout the day. And uh, it was over two days. So by the time the sort of third and fourth and final was being played, the more and more people came. Matera is the city where Mel, Mel Gibson basically put it on the map. He shot the Passion of the Christ there. Oh, okay. And it is an absolutely stunning city. It really is. I've never been there before. And uh, no wonder it's just sort of exploded now after that film. Very cool. How does the rest of the world feel about Mel Gibson right now? I think that that's a good question, actually. I think you can't deny the man's talent. His directing skills, I think, are just brilliant. That film, Passion of the Scri- uh, Christ, and then uh, Apocalypto, I thought was excellent. He's obviously mad. I mean, he went through that stint. He was basically... Yeah, I mean, crazy. He started calling. He was racist, wasn't he? Um, the whole thing. So people sort of put him on the on the shelf of being crazy rather than what he really meant. I think I'm not sure. I think it was a bit a touch of racism and a touch of um, you know misogyny. But like you said, it's an undeniable talent that he has, and I think throughout history, you know, some of the most talented people have not 
quite been how we would consider all there. Yeah, balanced in society. Yeah, uh, if you're if you've ever been in the industry, you come across all sorts anyway, with different opinions. And I think you just got to learn to be diplomatic. But you know, you got to also learn to call somebody out when they're wrong. Well said. Because he was wrong, and I think he got called out, and hopefully it straightened him out. Well, I don't think he's made any headlines since all of that. Um, I think he's had one or two movies come out since then, that, and I, I don't think that he's gotten into any trouble that we're aware of so far. So maybe he's learned his lesson or whatever. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, can I call you Raph? Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you so much. So, Raph, where were you born? I was born in London, first one out of my family that moved over to England, and yeah, I was the first one born there from Italy. So both of your parents are originally from Italy? They are, yeah. They're from the same village in the south. Near where you are now? Uh, No, I'm sort of probably about 800 miles away from that. I'm in the north by Lake Garda, sort of 15 minutes from the city of Verona. Oh, okay. And so you're from, I guess, towards, towards I don't know, maybe the ankle of the boot? Uh, just a bit further up, yeah. Sort of an hour in from Naples in the in the mountains. Gotcha. Have you ever been to a city called Terlizzi? Uh, I don't think so. Whereabouts is that? Oh, man, I don't know. I think it's somewhere near the either the heel or the toe. I don't remember. But I was just asking because a, a previous guest of mine lives out there, and he has this big, beautiful estate and a, a villa and all that stuff. I was just curious. Uh, is he is he Italian of origin, or is he American living in Italy? He His whole family is Italian, but he moved to America when he was like, I don't know, three or four or something, and then he lived here for about five. 50 years and then moved back. Wow. Wow. I must say, I was out in Verona last night, and there are tons of Americans here. Really? Yeah. I mean, you can't walk down the street without hearing. It's it's really nice to see and hear, because it's such a nice city for that. It's so international, cosmopolitan, Germans, Dutch, Austrians, Italians all coming together. I really love it up here for that reason. Very nice. I, I've i been to Rome, but I've never been to Verona. I'd love to go someday. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, top city. So you said you were born in London. What made your family move from Italy to uh, England? Looking for work. There was no work in the South. Uh, my uncle got a job, and so my dad went over, and then we actually moved to New York when I was eight years old. So I went to school there for a while in Queens, and uh, yeah, sort of lived the whole Italian-American East Coast lifestyle for a while. Then my dad preferred it back in the UK, so we just came back, really. And then over the years, I've sort of gone back and forth, my love affair with the United States. What do you love about the United States? You live, you have and currently live in some of the most, you know, metropolitan and beautiful cities in the world. Why do you like America? I find it... I love the people. I think they're very, very friendly people, the Americans. Opportunities for people. A lot of Italians that have gone over have, you know, achieved huge success because you can do that in the United States. You you don't get put in a box. And if, this is the way I see it anyway. You don't get put in a box immediately, whereas if you're brought up in a place, you're immediately sort of, oh, that's that type of person. They're from there. Whereas you go to the United States, you really can come from nothing. I do believe that. I know there's inequality as well. All I've experienced is is the good side of it, opportunities. I've worked in America. I've worked in Europe for Americans. I mean, to be quite honest with you, if it wasn't for the American influence, I'm not sure how much of a career as an actor I'd have. I play mostly Americans in American movies, uh, backed by American money usually. Whereas in the UK, you know, I'm very much the white but not quite And uh, it's very rare that I get seen for British roles. Really rare indeed. Interesting. Yeah. In America, I do utterly believe they have, I know they have issues, but in the same way that you pronounce my name correctly, there is an awareness of people coming from different parts of the world. And that's, that feels very respected. Well, that sounds awesome. I love hearing that. Yeah. 
Do you think that the worldview of America has changed, I guess, with our current president? Because we only hear one side of it. Well, we only get to see it from this side. And I'm wondering how we look, you know, from outside. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and it's the, the thing about Trump now, it's the United States has become an easy target for people to sort of, oh, look what they're doing. He's such an idiot and the way he sees things. And so, you know, people like to uh, at the same time, I think we should also look at ourselves. The UK is not in a great position. Italy as well. It's not regarded in the same way as it was for the type of people that I hang out with when Obama was in power. You know, there was much more of an open mindedness. Everybody really liked that. And I think the backlash of that open mindedness and uh, uh, attempted racial inequality tackle is Trump. People didn't like feeling that kind of liberal. So there he, he came through the ranks with his whatever it was. In a way, the paradox, I think, is that now people are seeing, oh, my God, we have to be careful here because look what can happen. Who who can come into power? Someone's so right wing, so uh, opinionated in a negative way, the way I see it. So, yeah, it's definitely looked upon differently at the moment. Well, that makes 100 percent sense. So let's actually talk about you now instead of the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> so. What pulled you into the entertainment business? I was 13. My mum took me to some drama classes locally. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the improvisation already at that age. And basically an agent had come one night to see a sort of performance workshop. And she pulled my mum aside and said, would you like to come to my theatre school? I think you do quite well there, blah, blah. And... I came. I was going to a sort of rough, comprehensive school at the time, and an all boys uh, sort of fight club. And so I was like, "Yeah, I'd love to go." Went in, and yeah, it changed my life. I, I was there from twelve or thirteen till sixteen. So that was my first introduction to it. And so it was from that that you just fell in love with um, with the arts in that form. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I was watching movies from the age of. God knows, every every morning it was my sort of escape place. So it really is the love for movies led me into it. Very cool. So when did you know that uh, it was acting that you wanted to pursue instead of some other, maybe some other art form? Well, after, after that, I left the industry for a bit and sort of pursued different college things. Um, and I traveled, went to the States, bartended for a while, I really enjoyed it. But I realized, you know, I needed something more. So I was about 21, 22 when I came back to the UK. I started applying for some plays and I, I sent off for a play, I auditioned for it. I got it and that was great. Um, then I got a couple of tiny roles in big movies. So that kind of set me going again. If I'm correct, you were in some pretty big movies with some pretty notable directors. Were you in Rush by Ron Howard? I was, yeah. How did that come about? That was uh, basically an audition in London I had to go on tape and then I had a couple of recalls and then I met Ron Howard in a room with Nina Gold uh, I remember sort of really prepping before that one and just getting focused on the on the role and felt good and uh, yeah he was he was an absolute charming gentleman who it felt like respected actors so I was able to be free in there and uh, I was lucky enough to get offered a role was that your first big role or did Saving Private Ryan come first? I don't remember which one came out. That was that was when I first came back to the UK. I think late 90s, early 2000s, I started writing my own letters to casting directors. And again, that was the whole American thing for Private Ryan. I, I sent a letter saying I'm a, I was brought up in Queens. I'm living in London at the moment and I hear you're looking for soldiers. And so that letter worked and I got into the casting office and did a couple of reads and got a small part in it. And how was being directed by Steven Spielberg different than being directed by Ron Howard? Do you know what? In a way, if I remember, that they're both pretty much much of a muchness. They don't put too much pressure on you. They just see what they want maybe in the casting uh, office and they kind of nudge you gently. If they like something, that's good. Keep that up or I'll oh, just change that bit. It's very simple direction. And it's, that's what's really nice about it for an actor. When somebody over-directs over you, it can become cluttered and it sort of gets in your head a bit. 
That makes sense. I feel like, you know, probably with most jobs or most employment situations, if you hire the correct person, you probably have to direct or, you know, mold a little bit less. It feels that way. And I've definitely learned that with the stuff I've made. It's just the direction almost comes in the choices of the people you use and the taste that you have. Absolutely. When did you decide or figure out that you wanted to start writing your own stuff? Fairly early on, I just didn't know how to do it. Uh, And then after my dad died, I just took the plunge and thought, you know, sod it. I'm going to try this out myself. And it started to work for me, really, because I just sort of simplified it, which was how do I tell a story that would affect me? It seemed to work. I didn't overcomplicate it, got the right people involved um, and sort of built my confidence that way. Um, I sort of come from a very, a very improvisational background as an actor, so that always helps me in, in building stories, whether it's in my head or with the actors around me. So that that was it. And also, really, the, the roles I was getting in the UK were quite limited, and I, was, I remember thinking, Jesus, these are crappy. They're a bit unfulfilling. So writing your own stories, you could really get into the head of a character that you know has an arc, starts with something and ends with something else, rather than one or two scenes here and there. I think Seth Rogen said once that um, the reason he started making his own stuff is because nobody would put him in the stuff he wanted to be in, so he just decided to do it himself. It's as simple as that, isn't it, really? Yeah, I guess it is. What was the first thing that you wrote? Uh, First thing I wrote was a short film called Call Me, which I was in. I I didn't direct. I really enjoyed it, and I thought, I've got to to direct the next one, so I, I I wrote and directed something called The Other Side of My Sleep, which was a story about an old Italian lady in London dreaming about her past in Italy. And she's on her deathbed and really sort of wants to die now. But the Italian family around her are trying to keep her alive. So it was a struggle between life and death and sort of understanding when it's time to go. Where did that idea come from? A little bit, my grandmother, and I remember my grandmother saying, no, it's time for me to go now, you know, and sort of being quite strong about it. And I thought, wow, that's that's courageous. And then, yeah, that's basically the sort of the seed of it. Do you think she was just like maybe tired of being here or just ready to move on? Or what what do you think was her reasoning for being, you know, quote, ready to go? (sighs) It's a good question, again, because I think there is definitely much more of an acceptance here in Italy that death is part of life. So they start gearing up for that later on. I mean, she had a dress in the wardrobe already that she had to be buried in. There was a real acceptance of that was part of the journey rather than tucking it under the carpet and going, you know, that's never going to happen to me. Let's move on. And how did the rest of the family feel about that? I think it started to, the way I wrote it was, it started to affect their relationships because it sort of puts them off balance so they start fighting amongst each other uh, and then towards the end they start appreciating each other more as they see it happening and also it was very loosely about the destructive relationship between a mother and his son and the cultural sort of problems with that in Italy the the son being the sort of king of the house and the daughter coming second so that was tackled a bit in my film as well. Interesting does that uh, Italian family dynamic translate to or transfer to East Coast Italians as well in America? Probably more so. Really? Yeah, I I mean, I'm generalizing huge here. Of course. But the Italians that live in the United States came from Italy 50, 60 years ago plus, right? So they took that culture with them, whereas obviously Italy's moved on since then. Now, if you don't come back to your home, then you stick with what you remember. Whereas the Italians that were in the UK were coming back and forth to Italy and they could see that it was, it was moving on in a different way. And so you kind of hold on to your roots, don't you, when you move away a little bit more. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's just it's the way it is and what I have, I've observed. I think that's a pretty fair statement. In, in all cultures, I think when we move, we, we hold on to a little piece of home. Yeah, I agree. So your film, The Other Side of My Sleep, tell me about that on the festival circuit. Was that your first time taking a a film on the circuit? Yeah, I I was on a plane to L.A. from London, and just before takeoff, I got an email saying you've been selected for the Boston Film Festival, and I couldn't believe it. I absolutely could not believe that my sort of little idea that I wrote in a notepad at the end of my bed 
had sort of got to the point where a festival, specifically the Boston Film Festival, had gone, yeah, this is a good piece of material. Let's, let's put it on the big screen. It, it knocked me back a bit. So I'm going to assume that you flew to Boston and went to the festival? I did, yeah. I didn't win it, but I was. the film was officially sort of part of the selection, which was nice. So what was that like, you know, being on that big of a stage for your first film? I think I was, was nervous watching it because you just don't want to bore the audience in any way. So I was on tender hooks, feeling the energy from the audience. You know, I was just my mind thinking they'll turn around and go, you idiot, you call this a film? I'm like, oh, yeah, no, sorry, I, somebody got it wrong. Yeah, definitely, you're right, I'll see you later. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then in the end, obviously, it wasn't that. And so it sort of gave me the courage to try another, to try my first feature film after that. I've heard a lot of people in the industry say that they sort of feel most of their career they feel like they're just waiting for somebody to tap them on the shoulder and say i'm so sorry there's been a terrible mistake you don't belong here it's those inner insecurities and uh, and you you need that you need that to keep you going in a way because if you were overconfident you'd just come up with crap probably you need a bit of that to sort of question yourself all the time is this right am i doing the right thing now that i've got older and i've just finished my second feature film transference uh, which I really enjoyed. I look at it more as an expression, a sort of experimental film, and I, I'm always looking for something new to come across rather than sticking by, conforming by old methods of making film. That's what I'm trying to do at the moment. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, similarly, in the way that we were talking about how we hold on to a piece of our culture when we move, I feel like the older you get, the more willing you are to let the past go and, and look for you know what's around the corner. So true. So true. You become happier with yourself, absolutely. And sort of, this is me, I'm going to try this out. I don't really care that much what other people think. Now, moving on from the other side of my sleep, you did a film project that was a little bit unique. I think it was called Film the Movie. Yep. What inspired that? Well, first, tell everybody sort of what the process was for that, because it's a very interesting and unique approach i think i think it was i just sort of decided to use all the resources around me i'd, I'd worked with some fantastic actors over the years and uh I, I built a way of working which is i i try to see now actually i was in a hotel in bulgaria on another movie and the cast said look we should try and shoot our own thing and i thought oh this is yeah because i'd been thinking about this indian character that i liked playing who was who wanted to make it in Hollywood. So I said, I've got a good idea. Let's just try it. And so we shot this little scene on a small DSLR and it was, we laughed a lot. I had some substance. I came back and edited a version on my iMovies and thought, this has got legs. Took it to my editor. He fixed it up. And I thought, how's that going to play in the middle of a film? So I started to come up with an idea and it took me, you know, 18 months plus to, to finish the movie. But I'd shoot a scene, edit it, show it to some actors and say, do you fancy being in the next scene? They'd, and they'd say, yeah, that looks really, I'd like to do that. So that's how I sort of built motivation by showing them bits of the film first. And then, yeah, the, the rest of the story sort of gathered pace in the edit room until we were happy. So if that was your approach, then there must be a whole lot of actors in that film, right? A lot, a lot. Like a lot, a lot. Yeah. That almost sounds like a logistical nightmare if you look at it, you know, if you take a step back and look at it as a whole. But I think that since your approach was to sort of do it scene by scene with, you know, who and what you had available. Yeah, that's a really, really great idea. It, it worked. It just seemed to work. I don't know why. It's just is the camera crew ready on Thursday. Great. Let's let's give the camera crew character names. So if they end up in shot, it's not going to look weird and make the camera crew, the, the documentary team following this guy, trying to make a movie. And it was a lot of fun. And also actors didn't have to prep much. I'd just text them going, this is what I need from the scene, is you coming in and I'll, I'll be this guy. And I remember actors turning up thinking, oh, sorry, I'm late. And I'd have the camera rolling on them already. So they were in the scene. I was in character. And they knew they couldn't come out of it. So it usually was one take. That is awesome. There's a little girl in that film, right? My daughter. That was going to be my question. So the little girl who's holding the camera and I guess sort of messing with the video camera, that's your daughter? I think if that's what you mean. Did she, yeah, she had like one tooth. She was six or seven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sky, she, yeah, she's, uh, she's my daughter. She's coming here today. She is so cute. Uh, she's 13 now. <laughs> 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh wow. So is she going to be an actress? She's done a couple of things. She was in Beauty and the Beast the movie. She had one scene with Emma Watson. Whoa, that's huge. Yeah, it was, Emma Watson was that little scene, you know, when she's teaching her t- to read. Oh, at the very, very beginning, right? That's right. Oh, when she's, you know, singing through the village or whatever. Yep, that's it. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah, so from that she went on to do, she's doing a British TV series called Grantchester, which is sort of the last series, last episode, she blew me away with her performance. I was like, where in the hell did you get that? That is extraordinary. I mean, her storyline, everything, and the way she performed it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm being probably very biased, but she was quite, quite amazing in that. Well, you certainly sound like the proud papa. (laughs) A little bit, yeah. Now, her mother, your wife, she is also an actress, right? Simone? Yeah, Simone, yeah. And how do you say Simone's last name? Uh, Labib. Labib. Her father's French Algerian. French Algerian. That's impressive. How did y'all meet? On a film set or something, I'm assuming? Uh, we did uh, something called Thief Takers. I was playing an uh, Italian American mobster and she was uh, uh, a cop. She uh, arrested me. I think mean, she chased me down the street with a, a gun. Yeah, I think that's pretty much our relationship since then. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. (laughs) Uh. My name is Phil Rossi. I'm the creator of the sci-fi horror experience, Crescent, along with Eden, Harvey, and a whole lot of other scary stories. I was quiet for a while, but I'm here to let you know that I'm back and in a big way. 50 hours of all new podcasts are ready for download on demand, including my new book, The Trance, a gothic cyberpunk detective story. And let me tell you, this book has got fangs. So here's the deal. For less than a cup of coffee or a pint of beer, you can become my executive producer. You can play a key part in taking my words off the computer screen, onto the page, and into the airwaves. For more info, free podcasts, and to sign up to become a part of my next big story, please visit patreon.com forward slash Phil Rossi. Now turn out the lights and take a deep breath, because the story is about to begin. So, film the movie, that went on the festival circuit as well and was nominated for some awards? Yeah, got into the Rain Dance Film Festival, and then I think I was in a hotel with my mate. He was filming something, and he said, oh, look, the, the Biffers have just come out, which is a British Independent Film Awards. I was like, oh, right. He went... What's the name of your film? I said, Flim the movie. He said, it's, it's on the list. I said, what are you talking about? He said, have a look at that. I mean, give me that. I was like, holy shit. What the? I, out of the um, I just saw my, my film nominated, and I, was just, I just couldn't believe it again. So how was it, you know, that time around? I know you were a little nervous the first time you went on the festival circuit. How was it this time? Well, I didn't feel that I'd finished editing the movie. It was too long. And I and I got a real sense of what the audience was feeling. They loved it up to a certain point. And then I felt like, all right, I need to take 10 minutes out of this movie. But it was a full house. And uh, overall, it was, yeah, really well received. And I just wish I'd had my tighter cut by then. I just didn't have enough time. But yeah, that was pretty nerve-wracking. I couldn't watch the film with them. I had to, I had to go outside and come in at the end. Really? Yeah. No, I hated that. It was like, you know, I don't know, five, six hundred people in there. Wow. I said to my daughter, can you open the film on the microphone and say, look, thanks for all coming. She goes, I'm not doing it, Dad. And I said, I'll give you 20. And she went, all right. <laughs> oh, instilling a work ethic. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I had to give her the cash first, though. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So... Tell me about The Hustle. I put an audition on tape in my house with an actress called Christina Chong, who's in my latest film. Four weeks later, I get a phone call saying, you've got the job. Who is in that movie? I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm familiar with that. Anne Hathaway and Rebel Wilson. Yeah, I don't know either one of those names. Just kidding. <laughs> so was that, was that filmed over there in Europe? It was in England, yeah. So what I loved about working with her was she's obviously 
you know, one of the top improvisers out there, Rebel Wilson, and and uh, she just took on board because I always sort of slot in my improvisation all the time, and she just took it on, and we were able to bounce back and forth, which was fun. She was cool, very cool. That's always good to hear. Always good to hear. You know what I liked about them? Very gracious. Really? They were both very gracious. It's like there's an actor coming in for a day. You know, nice, getting the, making sure the scene works and giving you the time it needs for them. And they're, they're, they're smart. They're not there for any other reason, you know? I think that sometimes that gets lost a little bit, whether it's ego or whether it's drive or whatever, patience. Um, I feel like that does get lost sometimes probably on the set. So that's good to hear that it didn't happen with those ladies. They were really nice. I mean, you know, you couldn't ask for a better job to go in and be able to come off the script a little bit, even if it was just to find the character, uh, the best way to play it just felt easy. That's awesome. Yeah. The the director, Chris Addison, I think a lot of kudos has to go to someone like that. Who's able to run a set without sounding like a disciplinarian. And that that's where it all starts from. Well, that makes sense. You know, it starts at the at the top. That film is either out now or about to come out, right? I think it came out Friday. Oh, well, there you go. It was a busy weekend. <laughs> <laughs> it was Mother's Day over here yesterday. So. Oh, right. Yeah. Same in Italy, I think. And then my daughter, um, we celebrated her college graduation yesterday as well. So it was a pretty big weekend. Congratulations. So I want to talk about Transference. Yeah. Now... Did you write this film? It was loosely based on a film that I'd written about 10 years ago, and I couldn't make it because it was set in the 80s. And I liked the story. It's a sort of strong love story that falls apart because of mental illness. So I'd been thinking for a couple of years how I'm going to make this. And I'd always go back to the ethos of using my surroundings and the, the resources around me. I was waiting for some some inspiration the lead female in it needed to be a particular type and that would have been the hardest thing to find and then one day I'm coming home with Sky we bump into this girl in the hallway she's just moved upstairs and and she seemed quite nice we had a chat she said oh I'm an actor I've just come out uh you know a drama school and I thought, all oh, right, okay. Well, I, I said, oh, we're actors as well. If you want to come to our workshop anytime, do. So a few weeks later, she came to one of my workshops. And immediately I was like, hmm, she's got something really interesting about her. There's an innocence there, but yet a deeper intelligence that just seemed to work. At the same time, this poet dancer had, had asked me to film his dance routine for this poem. And I and I kept putting it off a bit, thinking, okay, yeah, it's so boring just filming a dance routine. And then I listened to his poem, and her face came into my imagination. And I thought, oh, there's a story here. So I asked her if she wanted to come down to the South Bank, which is an area by the Thames, by the British Film Institute, uh, with the dancer. And I said, I'm not quite sure what I want to make yet, but sh- do you fancy coming down? I'll shoot something. And... This story transpired about nonverbal communication through this poem. And she became Katerina that day for me. And I thought, there's the story. I can, I can do it with her. And, and she was committed. And we didn't know quite if we were going to be able to finish the feature film. But we, I said to her, let's just try and put some things on a table and see if they connect eventually. And we sort of developed part of it and the rest of it. I always went back to this original script I don't know how, but five months later, I've just finished editing a one hour, 50 minute feature film. I swear I wasn't looking for it. Who was I? I since ask myself this question, was this an accident? Or is this what they mean when they say, meant to be? I've met somebody I really like. Does she know? This is just meant to be a temporary thing, Nick. Now it feels like you're changing. What the hell happened, Nick? I ask myself the same question every day. You're all the same! You're all the same! But you look fine to me.
as Newton's third law says, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Wow. Is that available where people can see it? Not quite yet. I've just, I'm in post-production and I started submitting it to film festivals. But again, it was a way to, I'd, I'd shoot something, let me let me mention her name, Amelia Johansson, who was amazing. She's Norwegian. So I used the Norwegian angle, a Norwegian nurse coming to London and getting lost in this world. And then uh, my wife was in it, Simone, Christina Chong, an actress I'd worked with on the Borgias. I asked her, she said, oh, let me see some of it. She goes, oh, yeah, no, I like that. I said, how would you, would you like to be involved? I think there's something about him going to visit an ex-partner and then discussing how things are moving on. And then she brings up his mental illness. And we discussed it a couple of times. I improvised it with her in her flat. And we were ready to shoot, so I called the DP. We went Monday, and that was Lottie Verbeek. So I've got a good few names in it, and, yeah, I'm really, really pleased with it. I'm just hoping it gets uh, recognized at some level. And if it doesn't, I'll still release it on Vimeo or, you know, self-distribution. But I'm a, I'm a little bit more optimistic than just that at the moment. Oh, very cool. That sounds exciting. Yeah, I think the subject, you know, mental illness, people not talking about it much, it sort of makes it worse and, and how everyday mental illness affects people's lives, really. So I keep asking you about, you know, worldviews outside of America on different topics. Over here, it's pretty much the same where we sort of sweep it under the rug as far as mental illness. Is that pretty common for the rest of the world as well? I think there is definitely something new happening at the moment where it's a little bit easier to mention it. I think mental illness in the past meant, you know, you're an absolute nutcase and you need to be in an institution. Now we understand the spectrum is broad. Children are suffering it in schools. The pressures of schools, massive, how it's affecting their well-being, right through to relationships and how they break down. And even at that point, nobody mentions I've got, you know, I might have something or it's already been established, but I won't talk about it. And I think a lot of these mental illnesses can be resolved just by the very fact of putting it on the table amongst other people. I almost feel like some of them, not all of them, obviously, are tucked away so deeply they become something more than they should be. And so that's part of it. Uh, that's really what I tackled in this film. This guy had a sort of one of the milder versions of bipolar and it was triggered by sort of an emotional reaction to this love story and so I kind of made her the antagonist of his illness as well but at the same time she carried her own transference which means passing on something that you learned as a child perhaps through your parents in the way you treat someone so that's where that idea came from yeah I had a psychotherapist friend of mine and so we talked about that a lot and I just made sure it was it was fairly accurate well, that's super uh, exciting. Um, I can't wait to see it. My wife is a master's prepared psychiatric nurse and, you know, has been for a couple of decades. So uh, this sounds like it's going to be a very, um, a very interesting film and it's of interest over here. So I, I can't wait. Well, I'd, I'd, to be honest, I'd love to send it to you, a private link, especially for you and your wife having seen it firsthand. Would it would mean a lot to me if she gave me her feedback and you too. That would be phenomenally amazing. I'm going to do that. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. What does contravento mean? Against the wind. And why am I asking that? <laughs> I think you you know that. <laughs> what is the name of the production company? <laughs> so why did you choose that as the name of your production company? Because I, I wanted to make films that go against the grain in what way uh i just wanted to challenge uh protocol challenge you know having to have a call sheet having to prep a shoot in the way people think this is the only way things can be done and i wanted to look at it more like a, an artist in a studio with paint all over the place and not quite knowing exactly what they're going to make until they start throwing it on the canvas sort of the way film the movie came together Absolutely. Going against conforming to a way that's already established. 
So on that topic, do you think filming in the U.S. is different than filming abroad? I think the spectrum, again, is broad in both continents. I think you can get involved with an independent film crew in the United States and make something amazing. It's probably harder to get seen, but it can be done. Independent films in the United States are brilliant and some aren't so good. And I think that goes, that's the same in Europe. How is getting your independent film out there, like how is that across the world? Like, you know, a lot of times people will spend a lot of money and time making a film here and then it never gets seen because, you know, there's really not much of a channel for distribution. Is it different where you are? I think it's the same. I think internet having platforms to sell your work or show your work is available to us all now. I made a couple of films in California that the director producer have sort of managed to make an income through Vimeo because it's a particular genre. So that's amazing. I think Vimeo is amazing. And so I think there's so many platforms to show your work. If it's a low budget film, but it's good, I almost feel like get it out there for free. There's no greater currency than someone seeing your your work and enjoying it rather than if it's made for millions, then you're going to have to make money back. But uh, it's much better people see your work. So get it out there somehow. There's YouTube, there's, there's Vimeo, that's at a lower level. And then if you get into festivals, you've got some leverage to talk to distributors, Netflix, Amazon. I got, I got Flim onto Amazon, uh, not Netflix, iTunes, Google Play. Uh, Voodoo, I think it was. So I was able to get distribution for Flynn because of the, I think, Biffa nomination. But yeah, there's various avenues to take. Well, that that's encouraging for, you know, the, the smaller backed artists out there. That's pretty encouraging. Yeah. I want to talk about No Way Home. Oh, yeah. That is a film about human trafficking, right? Yes. Yeah. And what inspired that? A friend of mine sent me a message saying, oh, they, they're looking for films about sex trafficking. It's for a competition. And immediately it was a subject about someone being a victim. That interested me. And I also enjoyed the challenge of coming up with a film that was three minutes long that had an impact. I didn't quite know what I was going to make again, so I just wrote a scribble on a piece of paper, right? You know, a girl in a car, guy says this, drops her off. And she just doesn't want to be there. So I actually, I think the initial script was much longer than that. It had cops in it. And then it just, I just kept bringing it back to something more simple, which was how does it feel to be that victim? And I submitted it. I shot a couple of scenes. And I think here's a lesson in being a director. I cut the second scene completely because it just didn't have the way it looked staged. I didn't like the lighting. And that was an executive decision to say, you know, I spent that much money, but I'm going to cut that scene. I think it's stronger without. And left me with the right amount of time in this film anyway. Sent it in and kept getting emails saying, oh, you're, you're number two now. You're, oh, you're number three, number two. You're still in your number one. And so we won the competition and they asked me to go out to the UN to talk about it. Oh, wow. So was that the prize was to go to the UN and talk about this subject? I think it was, yeah. It was just to, to be invited and show your film amongst uh, sort of dignitaries, I suppose. And yeah, it was really, it was nice. Very cool. Now, Raffaello, I know that it's been just about an hour and um, I, I do appreciate your time. But I, I want to ask you before I let you go, can you tell us about where people can find you on social media and where they can reach out? Uh, yeah, I've got... Some of the stuff you've spoken about is on my Vimeo page, Raffaello Degretola. Flim is on there as well, the sex trafficking piece. My uh, Instagram is at Rafti or at Contravento Films. Contravento Films has also got a Facebook page, which has got a lot of stuff on it. It's, it's all out there, I think. All right, fantastic. Everybody scroll down to those to the show notes and you'll find those tags and those links as well. So, and lastly, Raffaello, is there anything that we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Um, God. Tell me, have you seen any good films lately? Um, have I seen any good films lately? I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is? I I watch so many that I actually forget day to day. 
If I were to ask you then, what's what's your favorite film that comes to mind? Do you have anything? I do have a favorite film, and it's a little cheesy, but uh, it just speaks to me on a couple of different levels and has for quite some time. It's called Dream a Little Dream. Okay. And it stars Jason Robards, Piper Laurie, Meredith Salinger, the two Corys from back in the 80s, Corey Feldman and Corey Haim. They're both in it. Yeah. I think the film came out in 1989 or 90. I want to say 89. And it's... um. I guess in a way you could say it's transference because it's sort of a body switching movie kind of a thing. Um, right. Okay. I don't know if it just hit me at the right time in my life or whatever, but it just spoke to me on a few different levels. And so that is absolutely my favorite movie. Right. Well, I'm going to take that on and watch it. Well, temper your expectations. <laughs> I love gems like that, and I used to be a big fan of those guys, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman. Is that right? Yeah, that's them. Yeah. I think one of them died not long ago. Is that is that right, too? Yeah, Corey Haim, he died. It's probably been, golly, it's got to be coming up on 10 years by now, right? No wow. nah, seven, seven or eight years, something like that. It's been a while. Wow. Wow. And he was the, uh, he was the Canadian one. Corey Feldman was American, and Corey Haim was Canadian. Brilliant. I'm going to watch it. They, weren't they both, were they both in the Goonies? No. Corey Haim was not in the Goonies, but Corey Feldman was. Okay. They were in License to Drive together and uh, a couple of other movies. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. I'm going to check that out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Brilliant. One of my favorite films I was talking about the other day, which sort of inspired me to go back into acting, was a film called Midnight Express. Really? Just because of that guy's performance, Brad Davis, the actor. Do you, do you know the film I'm talking about? With, about uh, Based on a true story from a guy uh, who lived in Long Island, went to Turkey on holiday and tried to smuggle some marijuana onto a plane back to America, got caught and got 30 years in jail. That is quite uh, an impressive feat to, to <laughs> have the, to have the uh, I guess, the cojones to try that. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> I think it was back in the 70s or 80s anyway, but the story is about escape. And the guy, the American actor, Brad Davis, his performance in that movie is something extraordinary. And actually that was, I remember watching it and telling my girlfriend at the time, I'm going to go back to drama school. This guy's amazing. He's just inspired me again. Does he know it? Have you had an opportunity to meet him and tell him how he affected you? I wish I had. He, he died but he was one of the actors I would carry a photo of as inspiration. Him and uh, a German actor who was in the film The Lives of Others that won an Oscar, who also died straight after this masterpiece. It's amazing. They give these incredible performances and they go off and die, for God's sake. What are they doing? Well, I hope that uh, you don't have that kind of success. <laughs> I appreciate that, yeah. I want to be a failure. There you go. A long, long living failure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Raffaello de Grotola, thank you so much for taking the time and hanging out with me. I know that we are talking to each other from across a great distance. So thank you for being uh, flexible and making this work. I really, really appreciate it. And thanks for letting us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street. Listen, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's been really good. Well, it has been an honor and an absolute pleasure on my end. I look forward to you sending me the transference link and watching that with my wife. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts and opinions on Dream a Little Dream. Done. It's a deal. All right. Thank you so much, Ralph. You have a great rest of your day, all right? You too. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye. From executive producer Bill Bosert and writer-director Raffaello De Grotola comes the new psychological thriller, Transference. This is what happens when love, loss, and mental illness collide. I swear I wasn't looking for it. Who was I? I've since asked myself this question. Was this an accident? Or is this what they mean when they say, meant to be? I've met somebody I really like. Does she know? 
This is just meant to be a temporary thing. Like. Now it feels like you're changing. What the hell happened, Mick? I ask myself the same question every day. You no, fucking out your head! You're all the same! But you look fine to me. As Newton's third law says, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For more information on the release of this film, go to ControVentoFilms.com. Check the show notes for the link. Hey guys, this is Steve Owens from Fascination Street Podcast here with a very important message. I'm awesome. I bet you thought I was going to say something else, but nope. What's important here is that I am awesome. I started this show because I truly believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear those stories. In the short time I've been doing this show, I've interviewed actors, directors, writers, inventors, podcasters, musicians, pro athletes, Olympic athletes, actual war heroes, even a Bond girl and a luthier, whatever the hell that is, and of course, regular people. From people who wanted to be stars but never gave it a real try, to big company CEOs and people who got to meet their favorite president. I love getting to meet and speak with people who have a story to tell. I feel like everyone does, and it's my job to get them to tell it. You never know who my next guest will be. An Academy Award-winning actor, a platinum-selling musician, or your own mother-in-law. But one thing is for certain, you will be fascinated by their story. So come take a walk with me down Fascination Street. You can find Fascination Street Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and of course, FascinationStreetPod.com. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street.